Welcome to another message from Columbus First Assembly. Thanks for listening as we strive to learn and live the Word and ways of God. Our hope is that you're encouraged by today's message. Ready to go to God's Word this morning. This is Time Change Sunday. You have lost an hour of sleep. You may have more of a difficult time staying awake. I am so glad that Robert Morris is preaching this morning and not Pastor Rick. Because if you fall asleep, I won't see you. But actually, this is a an incredibly dynamic presentation. It's funny. Uh, the stories that he is going to share today are wonderful. It actually is a good message to watch on Time Change Sunday. And it is the last in the Blessed Life series. It's interesting to me sometimes when I feel that there's a theme that the Holy Spirit has lifted up for our church, such as the theme of finance, to find out other churches might be doing a similar thing. I was on Facebook, and one of my friends on Facebook, somebody that I follow, is Pastor Wayne Murray up there at uh, Grace Assembly of God. And recently, this was posted on his Facebook page. He's preaching on finance also, and here's how he put it. A tithe is a debt I owe. Offerings are a seed I sow. Alms are a gift I bestow. Rhymes really nice. I'm not a good rhymer, but, uh, but tithes are a debt I owe. That is the 10% we return to the Lord. It's not ours. Offerings are seeds that we sow, and alms are a gift that I bestow. And then Pastor Murray was quoted in this Facebook posting as this, I have never met a faithful tither that regretted it. I've never met a faithful tither that regretted it. Pretty strong statement, yet as I think back of my 30 plus years of ministry, faithful tithers, when they get into the flow of God's move on their life, you don't regret it. It opens the doors to so much. So, last of the Blessed Life series, are you ready? Get your note sheet out, because there are some things that I'm sure you're going to want to write down Every time I've gone through this, and you have to understand, you've been seeing this for six weeks. I've been preparing this for about five months, four or five months, getting everything ready with the videos and the note sheets and things. Each Sunday, I end up writing something down that I hadn't written down before because it just sticks with me. So here we go. Last week of The Blessed Life, Pastor Morris is talking this morning about the principles of multiplication. Enjoy. Hey everyone, how are you? Good to see you. So this is the uh, last week of the West Life series, and uh, as we've done every week, I want to welcome the churches that are joining us right now. So can we welcome the churches, all the churches all over the country that are joining us right now for this series? And I want to ask you to turn to Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9. This is the um, funniest message in the series, just so you know. It's, you're going to have a good time in church today, and that is allowed to laugh in church. It's allowed. Uh, so turn to Luke chapter 9. Uh, and let me just let you know a little bit as I go before I get in this, the scripture. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a math person. I've, I've, I've told you that before. Uh, I think in numbers. And uh, people ask me like, uh, are you for this? Do you want to do this? Uh, do you want to expand Pastor Robert in this way? Or Debbie will ask me about uh, maybe remodeling something. So, okay, you, uh, She knows this by now. My team knows this by now. Um, until you say a number, I don't know if I'm for it or not. I can be for it philosophically, but I may not be for it because you might be thinking a completely different number than I'm thinking. And I've even shared with Debbie, I can't hear the words that are coming out of your mouth <laughs> until I hear a number. It's like listening, some of you, this might aid you, but it's like listening to Charlie Brown's parents. <laughs> uh, I, what I hear is, what, 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 
What, what, what, what? $4,000. I heard that. I heard $4,000. That's what I heard. And, and, and that's okay. I can, I can decide how long will that take me to fulfill the what, what, what? But I, I have to have a number. Okay. In the same way, the title of this message is The Principles of Multiplication. Multiplication is a mathematical term, like addition or subtraction or division. But multiplication is better than addition when it comes to our resources. And our God is a God of multiplication. He is a God who can multiply. So let me ask you a question, okay? And you can answer me out loud at all the campuses and all the other churches. Would it be all right with you if God multiplied your resources? Would that be all right? Okay, let me show you the two principles of multiplication from a very famous passage. Luke chapter 9, verse 12. It says, when the day began to wear away, the twelve came and said to him, should the send the multitude away, that they may go into the surrounding towns and country and lodge and get provisions, for we are in a deserted place here. But he said to them, you give them something to eat. And they said, well, we have no more than five loaves and two fish unless we go and buy food for all these people. For there were about 5,000 men. Now, let me stop just for a moment because many, many people believe that Jesus fed 5,000 people. But that is not the case. Though in Jewish culture at that time, the way they counted crowds is they only counted the men because they were counting families. So when it says there were 5,000 men, if you include the, the spouses and the children and assuming that just each family had just two children, which per capita at that time it was four to five. But let's just say there were only two children. That'd be husband, wife, two children. That's four times 5,000. That's 20,000. This is a much larger miracle. Now, let me just, just so you know, the Bible backs this up. Stay in Luke 9. But the parallel passage of this scripture in Matthew 14, verse 21 says, Now those who had eaten were about 5,000 men besides women and children. So you can refer to the feeding of the 5,000. That's fine. As long as you know in your mind it's 5,000 families, not 5,000 people. So this, with five loaves and two fish, I would say that our God is a God of multiplication. Okay? Let, go back to verse 14. There are about 5,000 men. And he said to his disciples, make them sit down in groups of 50. I just want to comment here that Jesus is also a math person. And they did so and made them all sit down. And then he took the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he blessed and broke them and gave them to the disciples to set before the multitude. So they all ate and were filled and 12 baskets of the leftover fragments were taken up by them. Now, again, because numbers jump out at me, I think, well, why were there 12 baskets? And there are some re re reasons theological because of the region they were in it was called the region of 12 and things like that. Uh, but one reason could have been that uh, Jesus wanted each disciple to have a doggy bag. I mean, it could have, it could have, I'm just saying, all right? Twelve baskets left over, all right? Now, here's what I like to do. I don't know if you've ever done this before, but I like to put myself in a Bible story. Have you ever done this? And, and imagine how would I have responded had I been there that day? So I want you to do that today. That's what we're going to do today, all right? I want you to imagine you're one of the 12, all right? And you're on the Messiah Search Committee. And you've got a great candidate. He's healing the sick and raising the dead uh, and walking on water, which is like a bonus messianic sign. It was not prophesied in the Old Testament. Jesus, like, threw it in as a bonus. And uh, so... You, you, you have a, a high attendance weekend, okay? And so everyone sends out a mass email and you tweet about it and you have the largest crowd you've ever had. Most theologians believe this is the largest crowd that, uh, with whom Jesus ever spoke. Most theologians believe that. Uh, so all these people, 20, 25,000 people. I mean, it's phenomenal, all right? And so you have real good worship and let's say it's a Sunday morning service and then you turn it over to the guest Messiah to speak and uh, he gets up 
and at 12 noon, he should be, you know, wrapping up. That's, that's the way the time of service should end if it begins at, you know, 1045 or 11. So it ought to be wrapping up about that time. But he keeps going. One o'clock, he's still going. Two o'clock, he's still going. I mean, if this is during football season, you've already missed the first game. <laughs> Three o'clock, four o'clock, five o'clock. Six o'clock. Okay, listen, I am not exaggerating the text. Look, look, look at verse 12. It says, when the day began to wear away. You know what that means in the Greek? In the Greek, that means when the day began to wear away. <laughs> so this is just my holy imagination. I think the disciples formed a little committee. And I think they said, what are we going to do? <laughs> I mean, this is good, but this guy, he won't shut up. I mean, he's going all day we've not had a lunch break snack break anything and i'll tell you what if i don't eat soon i'm gonna die i'm right here i'm going to die right here i promise i will die if i don't get something to eat soon and i think one of them probably said you know what that's it and they said what what what's it let's tell jesus that the people are hungry he seems to care a lot about the people. <laughs> he, he doesn't seem to care much about us, but he does seem to care a lot about the people. So now let's pretend that you get elected the spokesperson. All right? So I want you to see this in your mind. Jesus is up there. He's speaking. He's teaching thousands of people, and you approach him while he's speaking. That is the inference from Scripture is that he was still speaking when they went up to talk to him, all right? So see it in your mind, all right? So you say, uh, Lord, hey, Lord, excuse me. Excuse me, Lord. Excuse me! Uh, boy, this has been good today. I tell you, this is, this is really good. This series of messages that you're bringing all in one day. Um, but... Um, we, we, we were talking, and, and, and we feel like that, that the people are getting hungry. Uh, now, I could go all night. I was just saying to the guys, I said, John, I could go all night. I tell you, this is so good. Um, but um, uh, we feel like the, the people are getting hungry, and, and it's getting late, and, and the restaurants are just about to close, Lord. And um, so we feel like that it would be better if, if you would just... Um, wrap it up <laughs> and the Lord says you're, you're, you're concerned about the people yes Lord it's, it's all about the people <laughs> and then maybe you've never seen this but I want you to pretend you're that disciple look, 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 look what he says then in verse 13 so he said to them well then you give them something to eat excuse me <laughs> yeah you and your little group over there, you're concerned about the people. Why don't you give them something to eat? Okay. It, it didn't go like you planned, did it? But now you have to report back to the committee. See, that's the hard part, always reporting back to the committee. So you go back over and they say, well, did you tell them the people were hungry? Yes, I did. It. I, told, I, 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 I used those words exactly. I said the people are hungry. So is he going to dismiss the service? Well, what did he say? He said for us to give him something to eat. <laughs> what? What did he say? He said for us to give them something to eat. What? Oh, look, this is a disaster. Just wait till the first church of the Pharisees hears about this. Oh, oh, oh. oh. And then there's some little kid that snuck back into town. And he's walking by, and he's got a long John Silver sack. <laughs> and so, you know, they just kind of grab the sack, and they open it up. He got the two-piece meal with extra rolls. <laughs> and you can imagine Peter. You know, Peter probably just grabbed one of the rolls and just... <laughs> and they said, stop it, Peter. Stop it. That's all we have. That's all we have. And then one of them said, that's it. I said, what's it? Let's tell Jesus... This is all we have. And he'll dismiss the service. Now, I want you to think. Think with me just for a moment. Think about this. If you had never read this story in the Bible, and you had 20,000 people and a two-piece meal, and you said, this is all we have, 
Don't you think he would have dismissed the service? Does it, that, doesn't that make sense? It does it? Yes or no? Does that make sense? Listen to me. Tithing doesn't make sense. Doing it God's way doesn't make sense. But it works. So, you're, again, you're the spokesman, and so, you know, you say, Lord, excuse me, Lord, just, just one more. This, uh, um, you, know, you know, a moment ago we were talking, as, I said to me how good this series is, you know, Lord. And um, you said for, uh, you know, us to, um, you know, uh, get the people something to eat, and uh, we've been working on that. And, uh, but all we have, Lord, all we have, we have uh, uh, two fish, and we have... Um, Almost five rolls, Lord. Peter ate some. <laughs> and, um, but uh, but that, that's all we have, Lord. So we're thinking we should just go with our original idea and just, you know, just. And the Lord said, okay, let me get this straight. You have, you have two pieces of fish and almost five rolls. I, I know how Peter is. And that, that's what you have, right? Yes, Lord, that's, that's, that's all we have. Oh, yeah, yeah, that'd be great. Have them sit down in groups of 50. Excuse me. Uh, Lord, I, I don't think I was clear. Um, um, we, we don't have a lot of these snack packs, Lord. Um, th- there was a kid walking by. Peter took it from him, Lord. I didn't take it from him. Yeah, yeah, that'd be great. Have them sit down in groups of 50. So now they're getting all these people to sit down in groups of 50. Now, I'm going to give you just a little bit of my personal opinion here. I think while they were getting them to sit down, I think one of them might have remembered a scripture from the Old Testament and gathered the guys together and said something like this. Hey, guys, I think I know what's going to happen. Do you remember in 2 Kings 4, Elisha fed 100 men with 20 loaves of bread? The bread multiplied, and they even had some left over. That, that, that's in the Bible. And we have one greater than Elisha here. By the way, the, that, those 20 loaves of bread, it, it specifically tells us they were first fruits. In other words, God can multiply the tithe. So he said, I, I, bet, I bet you when he prays over it, it's going to multiply right there in front of us. And that is actually what many Christians believe happened. That when Jesus prayed, it just multiplied. But that's not what happened. Now, here, here, here's what I, I, I can see happening. Peter probably just grabbed one. Cause I just kind of like Peter. He's kind of the forceful one. You know, he probably grabbed one and said, here, 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 Lord, pray over mine first. Here, pray over mine first. Here, Lord, pray over mine first. Watch, watch, watch what happens when he prays. Lord. Just watch, just watch. Pray over mine first. But look, look, look at what verse 16 says. He blessed and broke them and gave them to the disciples to set before the multitude. Okay, so here's Peter saying, here, here, Lord, here, bless mine. And so Jesus takes this piece of bread from Peter, lifts it, lifts it up to heaven and says, Father, bless it. Breaks it and hands half of it back to Peter. Uh, are you through praying? <laughs> yes, Peter. It's blessed. Now go give it away. And you just watch what happens because the master's blessed it. You want to pray some more? <laughs> no, Peter. Now, I know the text doesn't say this, but the principle. Think about the principle. Think about this. Jesus blessed it. Here's what he's thinking. Peter, you don't understand. Once you bring it to me first, and I bless it, you watch what happens. Because I've blessed it. Personally, though, I think Peter walked up to the first person and said something like this. Take just a little piece. (laughs) What would you have said? Take a little piece, a little piece. He's going down the road, you know, take a little piece, take a little piece. I said a little piece. You pig, what is wrong with you? You can't follow instructions or something. So you take take a little piece. He gets down to the last guy. There's a crumb in his hands. Sweat 
from his brow down on his cheek. A little drop of sweat there. And right before the guy reaches to grab it, this crumb grows in Peter's hands. And Peter says, hey, you have more. <laughs> Listen, the miracle did not happen in the master's hands. It happened in the disciples' hands. Once they gave the first to Jesus and he blessed it. And then they gave over and above away. So two principles of multiplication. All right, they're real simple. Here's number one. It has to be blessed before it can multiply. It has to be blessed before it can multiply. And we've learned from this series, the way our finances are blessed, we've we've seen this over and over again, is we bring the first 10% to the house of God. Even Hebrews backs it up, New Testament, that Jesus himself receives and blesses our finances. So you have to give the first. See, I know some people who give a little here and give a little there, but they don't bring the first 10% to the house of God. Listen to me, their finances are not blessed and they will never multiply because only Jesus can bless them. Think, think about this. What if the disciples had given away given out the two fish and the five loaves before Jesus blessed it. I'm going to say that again because that's extremely important. What if they had just started giving it away and Jesus had not blessed it? Would it ever have multiplied? No. It's a blessing. It's the same way when you give a little here and a little there, but you don't bring the first 10% to the house of God. It does not have the blessing of Jesus on it. There's a couple in our church that when I shared this series one time, uh, they had been giving... 10%, but they'd been giving 5% to Gateway and 5% to uh, a missions organization. And when I shared about the tithe, we we do believe in giving missions organizations, but that's over and above the tithe. The tithe comes to the local church where you are. And so they they said, we had the check written, we tore it up and made the check out for the full 10% to the church. And here's what they said, that was on a Sunday. On a Monday, we had been waiting, waiting for a bonus that we were supposed to receive, been told we would receive it, We'd been waiting for months for this bonus. And on Monday, it was in the mail, and they wrote a letter that said, we are so, we feel so badly that this took so long for you to get this that we actually added some to it. And the amount that they added was the exact amount that they added the day before on their check. You will never convince me. That was a coincidence. That's, it's God saying, do it my way. So it has to be blessed before it can multiply. Here's principle number two. It has to be given away before it can multiply. It has to be given away before it can multiply. So the first principle refers to to tithing, bringing the first 10% to the local church, and Jesus blesses it. But once he's blessed it, now you can give over and above. You you can give an an extra offering, or or to, for, for in our case, we call it heart for the kingdom. You can give offerings over and above to missions organizations, to things like this. Okay, but it has to be given away. Think about this. What if the disciples, after Jesus had blessed it, what if the disciples had eaten it? It never would have multiplied. Two, Two fish, five rolls. What if Jesus blessed it, and then they just ate it? It never would have multiplied. There are a lot of people who will tithe, but they don't give anything above. It, and here's the, sad, here's the sad thing. It has the potential to multiply, but they just keep eating it. Okay, so let me tell you how this worked out in, in my own life and in Debbie's life. Uh, I got saved nine months after Debbie and I were married. And I heard, a few months later, heard my first message on tithing, and immediately we tithe, and God began to bless us. Uh, I went to Bible college, and then I was a traveling evangelist. So I did not work at any church. I didn't receive any salary from a church. At that time, I only received offerings or honorariums when I would travel and speak. And so well, I'm doing that for a living. And um, the, the Lord spoke to me one day in my quiet time. And he said, I want you to get your finances in order so I can bless them. Now, I want you to think about that. That's a very important impression that I received from the Lord. I want you to get your finances in order so I can bless them. God cannot bless things out of order. And we have a stewardship department that can help you get your finances in order. So I said, well, Lord, what do you want me to do? Back then, I didn't know what to do. 
And he told me three things. So I'm going to tell you the three things he told me. He said, number one, get out of debt. Now, this means different things to different people. Different people have different convictions, okay? For us, we could still have a mortgage, uh, but we were not to borrow for depreciating items, only appreciating items, like a mortgage on a home. So we have a mortgage to this day, and we have had a mortgage, but we put it on a 15-year note, and we do our best to pay it off, each, okay? So I just want you to know, because when I say that, I don't want you to, I want you to let the Lord apply it to you how he applies it to you, okay? So, number one, he said, get out of debt. So for us, the first thing that we need to do, we had this car that was too big for us, the payment was too big, and so we sold that car and we bought a car for cash, $750. That was all we could afford. So we bought a car for $750, but I, you got to hear me. We actually loved that car. I mean, we loved it because we were getting our finances in order. We loved that car. We prayed over it. Uh, we anointed it with oil about a quarter week, and, um, <laughs> and we drove that car. Okay, second thing the Lord said to me was don't manipulate don't manipulate. Now, I was in ministry, but a whole, whole bunch of people manipulate for money. And God never blesses manipulation. Manipulation comes from a root word that means witchcraft. So you, you cannot manipulate. You can't drop hints and expect God to provide for you. And so for me, I said, well, Lord, how does that work out? He said, well, when someone asks you to come speak, they say, what are your financial requirements for coming? And you say, pay our expenses and give us an offering. And some of my friends would actually say, pay us, or pay our expenses, give me, give us an offering. And the offering has to be a minimum of, I never even said that. I just said, whatever, just pay our expenses and give us an offering. Here's what the Lord said to me. He said, from now on, you say, I have no financial requirements for coming. By the way, this was about 30 years ago, and I still do that to this day. I have no financial requirements for coming. And the Lord said to me, I want to teach you who your provider is. That it's not how you arrange things, it's me. Now, again, other people, you can do things differently. Don't put this on, on you. Let the Lord speak to you what he wants you. So this guy calls me. I will never forget. First guy calls and says, uh, Robert, can you come and speak? I said, yes, we worked out date. He said, what are your financial requirements for coming? I said, I have no financial requirements for coming. And I remember he said, well, that's good because I don't even think we can pay your gas. Now, he didn't say pay your expenses. He said pay your gas. Let me tell you why that's important. We get in that $750 car. We start driving. It was to Oklahoma. We start driving to Oklahoma. I stopped to fill the car up with gas. I went in to pay for it, and the lady said to me, it's taken care of. I said, what do you mean it's taken care of? She said, because when you pulled in, God told me that I was to fill your car up with gas. And I went out, and I got in the car, and I said, Lord, I sure like doing it better your way than my way. And here's the third thing the Lord said to me, give. So he said, get out of debt, don't manipulate, give. Now, I have to tell you what happened. Uh, I, I said to the Lord, uh, I said, Lord, um, I do give, I tithe. Now, I, please don't get offended by this. This is just the, what I, the impression that I got in my spirit when I said that. I said, Lord, um, I do give, I tithe. I felt like the Lord went, <laughs> I mean, that really, I, I mean, I kind of felt like it was like, <laughs> idiot. You know, I and mean, that's what I felt. And I'm like, what do, you, what do you mean? Lord, I do. I give 10%. He said, you don't give 10%. You return 10%. He said, the 10% is mine. And when you read the language in the Bible, if you don't return it, then you've stolen it. That's the language. I can show it to you in uh, uh, Joshua and in Malachi. Robbed and stolen. Those are the two words God uses. He used it. So I said, well, Lord, what do you mean give? He said, I mean give over and above the tithe. That's when you give. And I asked him three very important questions. I said, well, Lord, how will I know when to give? How will I know where to give? And how will I know how much to give? Aren't those important questions? Listen to his very simple answer. Here's what he said. I'll tell you. I'll tell you. My people hear my voice. My sheep hear my voice. And so I said, okay, Lord. So at, not long after that, I go to speak at a church. Now, you have to remember, the only salary that Debbie and I received was when I would go and speak in a church and if they would give us an offering. And I said, you don't have to give us anything. So I go to speak to this church, and it's the only speaking engagement I have for the whole month. I only have one engagement that whole month, all right? And it's at a church with about 60 people in attendance. 
And I go and I speak at that church. And I said, I have no requirements coming. The pastor gets up afterwards. He tells the whole church that. He said, he has, he has no financial requirements coming. I want us to give an offering. And I want us to give a, a, a good offering. So they count it, and then they bring a check to the pastor. And we're standing like right here at the front. And the pastor brings me this check. He says, look at this. Look at this. He said, we've never given this much. And he was so excited to be able to do that. And I looked down at the amount, and the amount was, a, was the exact amount of our monthly budget. Exactly. And it had dollars and cents on it. And you have to remember, at that time, we also had an office, and we had an, uh, an employee, a person that helped me to set up meetings. So some of the meetings I did were large meetings and were gathered churches together and things like that. And so I looked down, and I remember thinking, this is my only meeting for the whole month. You told me not to ask for anything, and God, you are so faithful. And while I'm looking at that check and thinking how faithful God is, I kind of glance up, and I look over the shoulder of this pastor that's talking to me, and I see at the back of the church a missionary that had just spoken right before I spoke, shared a report, and this voice said to me, give him the offering. And I remember exactly what I thought. I rebuke you, Satan. <laughs> that's, that's not God. That's not God. Get behind me, Satan. Get behind me, Satan. That is not God. I remember this. It's funny, I know, but I remember even saying, that's not you. That's not you. I know you. that's not you. You would not do that, God. And the Lord said, give him the offering, the whole offering, give him the offering. And I remember saying to the Lord, again, you just have to know that I talk to the Lord funny and he talks to me funny. I remember I said to the Lord, Lord, you're not thinking clearly. <laughs> this is the exact amount of our budget. We have no other meetings this month. You know, I, I preached a good message and you got all pumped up and you want to give to a missionary now, Lord. Of it. But this is, this is, you provided this for us. And the Lord said, give him the offering, give him the offering. And then I remember the Lord said to me, I told you that I would tell you when to give and where to give and how much to give. And I'm telling you to give right now to that missionary the whole amount. And so the sanctuary was clearing out by now, and I endorsed the check when no one was looking, folded it in half, and I went to the missionary and said, I'm going to give you something, but don't look at it until after you leave, because it was a very large amount. And I said, and um, don't ever tell anyone I did this because I didn't want to manipulate in any way. I, I have, I believe now I'm supposed to share these testimonies to help other people. But back then I didn't share any of these things that I was doing. So I gave him this offering and uh, he, he, you know, said thank you. And then Debbie and I walked outside and there were some couples standing in the parking lot. And one of the couples said, hey, we're going to go get some pizza. Do y'all want to go? And we said, yeah, you know, because we were bro you know and so yeah sure oh yeah sure we love going to pizza so we go eat pizza with them and there are six couples total so debbie and i and five other couples the six guys sat on if you see this in your mind sat on one end of the table the six girls sat on the other end of the table debbie's all the way at the end on that end i'm at this end all right these four guys started talking about something they got in some conversation about football or something you know and then this guy across from me that I had met one time before, just once, I just met him one time, he just leans across the table like this, you know, and so I kind of lean across, I don't know what he's going to say, and he said to me, how much was the love offering? Just like that. And again, because I'm a numbers person, I knew exactly what it was, and so I told him the number. And remember, it was an offering, not an honorarium. An honorarium is with zeros. It's a round amount, like 250 or $500 or something like that. This was an offering that had, you know, dollars and cents on it. So I told him how much it was. And then this guy says to me, where's the check? Like that. And, and I know you're supposed to tell the truth, but I got kind of flustered. I didn't know what to say, and I didn't know why this guy was questioning me. And so I just heard myself say, Debbie has it. And so he says to me, go get it. I want to see it. So I said, okay. So I get up and I walk down where Debbie is and I lean down to her and I said, how's your pizza? Is it good? Okay, good. You know, there's nothing else to say. There's no check. And so I go back, and again, I know you're supposed to tell the truth, but I don't know why is this guy asking me this? Why is he questioning me? And I didn't want to say, in my heart, I didn't want to brag. 
I didn't want to say, we gave it to a missionary and it's the only meeting we have this month. And I didn't want to say that. And so I just heard myself again. I said, it's in the car. <laughs> and he said, it's not in the car. So I said, where is it? <laughs> I mean, you know so much, pal. I, I just, I start getting frustrated. Why is this guy grilling me like this? What is, what's going on here? And this guy said to me, who, by the way, is now a member of our church and has verified this, this testimony. This guy said to me, you gave it away, didn't you? I said, yes. I said, how, how do you know that? I'd only met him one time before. I said, how do you know that? He said, because God told me. And he reached in his pocket and he pulled out a check that he had written before he came to the service that night. And I found out later, which I didn't even know. He didn't even attend that church. He just heard I was speaking and God told him, go give him this check. So he writes a check out before he comes. He holds this check out that's made out to our ministry and he holds it up like this. Now listen to me, before God in heaven, and this man has verified this, it was exactly ten times the amount of the check that I just getting right down to the penny. Exactly. He said, here. And he's holding the top of it. And I reached out and I took the bottom of it. But he wouldn't let it go. <laughs> and I, I, I realized he, he wants to tell me something. He wants to say something. I now know he wanted to impart something. You do know there's a gift of giving in the body press. There's a gift of giving. That's a spiritual gift. So I'm holding the bottom. He's holding the top. He looked right across the top of the check, right into my eyes. And he said, God's about to teach you about giving so you can teach the body of Christ. And he let the check go. Here's what came into my mind when he let that check go. I, here's what I thought. This is God's money. This is not my money. This is God's money. All of it from now on is God's money. By God's grace, I have had that thought with every check that I've received since then. And we've been very blessed financially because for some reason people buy the books that I write and so we've been very, very blessed. I still don't know why, but we've been very blessed. We've been able to give a whole lot to the kingdom of God. But I thought this is God's money. Do you know the first thing we did? We bought a single mother car and we still had the $750 car. We started paying people salaries that were out of work. We started giving 70% of our income to the Lord we just started giving and we never told anyone and, and f money started coming in from everywhere and we just kept funneling it through to people. I remember in, a few years later, we uh, uh, had a van that we traveled in as a green van and uh, I remember the Lord told me to actually to sell it and we traveled all the time at that time. My son, who's, who's uh, my oldest son, Josh, some of you know him, um, when he was three years old, we were somewhere speaking and someone actually said to him, where do you live? He said, in the van. So, um, so the Lord told me to sell the van for $12,000. I sold it. We went to the mission field right after that. And this missionary uh, what, drove this old rickety van. And I said, why don't you get you a new van? He said, I'm about to. He said, God showed me last week a van that we're going to buy. I said, how much is it? Anyone want to take a guess? $12,000. And we bought that van. I, we've been living this way for years. Giving and giving and giving extravagantly. And, and it, it's verified. The elders of the church know it. Steve knows it. Steve is telling me I'm one of the highest givers in the church. That's not because of my salary. It's because of the outside income that the Lord's blessed me with. And I'm grateful for that. But let me wrap this up. Let me tell you what happened. A few years after this, I was having my quiet time. And the Lord just spoke to me one day. I was reading in Philippians about Jesus gave up everything. And the Lord said to me, would you give me everything? And when he said it, I knew what he meant. He, he meant everything in my personal checking account, everything in our, Debbie and mine, everything in our personal savings, everything in our ministry account, and everything in our ministry savings, which would be like a business account. That was where, where, where our income came from. Everything in our retirement. At that time, we had two cars both cars and our house and the way we, we did that by the way because we gave it to a pastor that had five children 
and the church said the best way for you to do it would be to for the church to buy the house as a parsonage and then you give the proceeds back to the church. And so that was what we did. And there's the man who did that, who oversaw that transaction, is also a member of our church now, and can verify that we gave that to the church. So, and that was not Gateway. That was the church I was a member of a long time ago. So, anyway, we gave everything away. So, the next morning, I'm thinking about it, and I'm because I'm a math person, I'm adding it up in my mind. All these accounts, you know, the, the cars, the house, I'm adding it up, and the Lord said to me, what are you doing? I said, nothing. <laughs> he said, no, what, what are you doing? I said, well, I don't want to tell you what I'm doing. And you know, if you're thinking something, but you don't tell him what you're thinking, he doesn't know. <laughs> yeah, he knows, just so you know, he knows. So I said, well, Lord, I said, I, I, I'm not having a real spiritual thought right now, so I don't want to tell you. He said, tell me what you're thinking. I said, well, you know that old saying, you can't outgive God. He said, yeah, I've heard that. I said, um, well, I, I said, I don't mean this wrong, but I think I did. <laughs> I mean, when you add up everything that I gave, I said, this time, I think I've got you. I have no reason why I said that word. I said, I, I think I've got you like that. And the Lord said to me, you think you've got me? And when he said that, the phone rang. And I picked up the phone. By the way, the man on the other end of the phone is a member of our church now and has verified this story also. I picked up the phone and I said, hello. And this guy said, Robert, God told me to help you with your transportation. And I thought, he's going to buy us a car. But even if he buys us a car, um, we just gave away both cars. By the way, at that time, we'd given away nine cars. We've given away a lot more cars since then. And by the way, uh, let me just uh, brag on the Lord through you. Last year, you, Gateway Church, gave over 100 cars to people. So it, it's contagious, the spirit of giving. And so, anyway, I, I was like, well, even if you buy a car, Lord, I've still got you. Because gave away all our retirement and house. And I said, i still got you. But thank you for the car, you know. And uh, so I said, well, what did the Lord tell you to do? That's what the guy said. He told me to buy you an airplane. And he said, I'm going to pay for the maintenance and the hangar and the insurance and the fuel. And I've hired a pilot and I'm going to pay his salary. Here's his name and number. And you just call him and tell him where you want to go and when you want to go. And the Lord said to me, gotcha. <laughs> gotcha. Now, now, now listen to me. This is not a message give and you get an airplane, okay? <laughs> By the way, to, I want to clarify, he gave the use of the airplane to us and we gave the use of it back to him about a year later and I, we don't have an airplane today. I don't own an airplane, the church doesn't own an airplane. So it's, this is not about an airplane because that is not the best part of the testimony. Here's the best part of the testimony. A while after that I was reading and I was reading the most famous story about Solomon and you know this story. What's the most famous story about Solomon? The most famous story about Solomon is that God said to Solomon, ask anything you want, and I'll give it to you. Can you imagine God saying that to you? Can you imagine that? So I'm reading that, and I thought it said at night the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream and said, ask anything you want. So I thought the Lord leads us when we're reading the Bible. I thought, I wonder what happened that day. What happened that day was he was inaugurated the king of Israel, and it was tradition for the king to sacrifice one bull when he was inaugurated. Do you know how many Solomon sacrificed? One thousand bulls. One thousand. That's pretty extravagant. And I remember the Lord said to me that day, I only say... To extravagant givers, ask anything you want. He said, I would never say that to a selfish person because I couldn't trust them. But I can trust givers. Now, I'm not even thinking about that Debbie and I had given away everything we had. But right then, when the Lord said that to me, he said to me, Ask. Ask anything you want. And I knew exactly what I wanted. 
I've been very honest with you, and you know this. I have an immoral past. I was immoral after Debbie and I were married. And I thought when she finds out, it's going to end our marriage. So I knew exactly what I wanted. I said, God, I want for Debbie and I to be passionately in love for the rest of our lives. And this May, we celebrate 35 years of marriage. That's better than an airplane. That's better than an airplane. blessed life. This is not a series just about your finance, although your finance is intricately, intricately connected. This is a series about how to walk in the blessings of God. Even when I'm not preaching, I'm very involved in the preparation, and so I have been rereading my copy of the Blessed Life book. And this week, as I was reading, I ran across a couple of statements that were made. In my copy, it's on page 92. I'll put the reference, the scripture reference, up on the screen. It's also in your bulletin. This is from Deuteronomy chapter 15, verse 10, and it says, You shall surely give to him, and in context, it's about a person in need. It's a person who has a need. You shall surely give to him, and your heart should not be grieved when you give to him. Now, here's, here's why it shouldn't be grieved. Because for this thing, the Lord your God will bless you in all your works and in all to which you put your hand. The Lord is just not going to bless your paycheck, your stewardship. The Lord will bless you in everything you put your hand to and in all of your works. That talks about marriage. That talks about family. That talks about so many other things. And then Pastor Morris then wrote this just under this passage of Scripture. He says, Notice that the reward for being a giver is a blessed life. God says he will bless you in everything you put your hand to and in all of your works. And as your this is why I bring this material to you. Because I want you, people of God, to live in and to walk in a blessed life. You've been listening to a message from Columbus First Assembly. We hope that you've been encouraged in your spiritual journey. If you're not part of a local church and would like to attend one of our regular services, our church is located at the corner of 10th and Iowa Street in Columbus, Indiana. Our Sunday morning worship services start at 10 a.m. and our Wednesday evening studies begin at 7 p.m. And while you're online, check out our website at columbusfirstassembly.org for details and information about our church. You will also find other messages and series that you can listen to or download. Thanks for spending some time with us and for taking advantage of this resource from Columbus First Assembly, where we strive to learn and live the word and ways of God.